Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, which we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast. It's a conversation about the Beatles in which we talk about anything we feel like, their past, the present. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my weekly Beatles syndicated show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my three other co-hosts. First of all, the writer for Beatles Examiner, we have Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, longtime writer for Beatle Fan Magazine. Been with them since the very beginning, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have our resident musicologist and longtime writer for the New York Times. He used to write for their classical department, now a freelance writer, Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On the program this time, we're going to be doing a special salute to Sir George Martin, who on January the 3rd will be turning, fingers crossed, uh, 90 years old. So we're going to be talking about him and his massive contribution to the Beatles and to the world of music in just a few moments. But before we do that, we just want to bring up very quickly the the big news item in the past week of uh, the Beatles' music now being offered on nine different streaming services. And it has proven to be extremely popular. And Steve has written a number of articles on this. And I thought, Steve, why don't you just uh, tell the folks more about this and we'll all kind of chime in. Well, I I think uh, what was interesting was when uh, they announced uh, uh, before Christmas, or it it actually leaked out um, before Christmas first, and then they announced it officially and I think a lot of, especially older fans, myself included, kind of underestimated how popular this would be, how big this was. But it turns out it's been very big. There's been, they have, uh, Spotify uh, contacted me yesterday and confirmed the stats that uh, have been floating around that uh, the songs have been added to over 673,000 playlists. And that what's really interesting is that 65% of its listeners on Spotify listening to the Beatles are 34 years or younger, which means they were born after the Beatles broke up. But beyond that, I mean, the significance is that it makes the Beatles music a lot more available to everybody, not just younger, younger people, although apparently younger people are the ones that are really into it and so i mean this is and and this is something again like itunes the beatles resisted for a long time you know we don't know why all of a sudden they you know what financial arrangements they made to to you know make this happen or whether they just decided to go with it um you know but i mean obviously they're getting paid for this um and how much they're getting paid for we don't know but it's just it, it it I think it needs to be mentioned, and I think also, you know, people who are saying big deal should be aware that there's a lot of people that are for the for whom this is really a big deal, you know, and and garnering um, comments from Facebook. A lot, you know, there were people both ways who said no, I don't care, and there were other people who said, oh, this is fantastic, and there are a lot of people for whom this is really fantastic. So there you go. Well. You know, the, we've often talked about this, that the name of the game in uh, a music catalog thriving is to always reach new generations of people and younger people. Mm-hmm. So for that reason, this is extremely important, just like when the Beatles were offered on iTunes. That was a big deal at the time, five years ago now, but it, it still was a big deal. So Al, Alan, you want to offer your comments about this? I, I think that... It- you know everything that you've said about reaching younger audience is is true, and um, but you know I mean for for someone of um, I guess my age or our ages, uh, it's sort of Spotify is sort of like fundamentally the radio, except of course you can program it, which is an improvement over the radio. But it's it's kind of like saying the Beatles are going to be on the radio. You're not going you're going to hear them, but you're not going to own the tracks. And mm. um, I guess you know one aspect of the generation gap as it as it currently is is that um young listeners don't necessarily feel the need to own a copy of the stuff that they like 
And it's kind of hard for me to understand that. But OK, you know, if that's the way it is, it's the way it is. But uh, I, I've. I've never trusted the the cloud, so to speak. I mean, I use the cloud. I've got plenty of stuff up there. But um, I always feel like, uh, you know, I want a copy of Sgt. Pepper on my shelf in case whatever service I might listen to it on goes down or whatever. You know, I want it. I want it available to me here. And I want to look at the cover. I want to look at the inside, all that stuff. Uh, apparently, these things aren't aren't that important to younger listeners now. Uh, so, but on the other hand, you see them going out and buying vinyl versions of things. So I guess you can't even generalize these days, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's great that they're on there. It's great that, that the numbers are what they are to put it in some perspective, however, and, and I'm not sure exactly how to read this perspective. One news report this morning had the, headline um justin bieber crushes beatles on streaming um because his new current song has been streamed something like 129 million times as opposed to <laughs> whatever but i mean that is the beatles have been available for like four days as we speak now and that song has been available for a while so I, i'm not sure how you really even compare those things but um, it was an unfortunate headline I saw it personally. <laughs> really? Hmm. You know, it's kind of interesting. How do you gauge the popularity of an artist now? Is it more how many streams they get? Is that more important than the sales? <laughs> Al, you it's it's, get, it's getting to that point, actually, because uh, one of the major labels announced last week that they, I think that they had accumulated more revenue from streaming than from downloading and certainly from physical sales. So it's getting to that mm. point. But what I find kind of amusing is this, uh, all of this, this wide-eyed surprise that younger people are, are uh, interested in Beatles music, which is, you know, I figured that, uh, you know, that, you know, that's been a fact of life for a very long time. Anybody who's who comes to the Fest for Beatles fans can see that the vast majority of the of the the attendees at the Fest now, I you know, I don't know the percentage, but certainly of the vast majority are younger people, are people in their thirties and uh and twenties and teens and tweens, et cetera. Uh, you know, the people that are, you know, my age are definitely in a minority now. And of course, there's the example of one, you know, the huge success of that album is, you know, greatly uh, attributable to young people. Because again, people my age, uh, you know, really had no use, you know, they had no particular need unless they were ardent collectors who had to have everything they really had no need for that album and yet it has become it became this phenomenon so the fact that uh, that the, the that the vast majority of people that are streaming beatles music are younger people is hardly a surprise but you know the media being what it is, they blow it up into this uh, uh, into this this big story. But um, it's uh, you know it, it's uh, you know it's it's not of great interest. Uh, you know, kind of um, in the same bag with Alan, uh, in that you know even though I use some of those streaming services, the fact that Beatles music is on there really doesn't really mean anything to me because I have Beatles music in so many other different formats. So, mm -hmm. and, and most of us, certainly people, again, of, of my, uh, my vintage usually listen to them either on vinyl or on CDs or, you know, whatever. We don't really listen that much to them on digital, you know, other than the fact that uh, a lot of us, uh, especially when the uh, the 2009 remasters came out, a lot of us did indeed take those you know those CDs, put them into our iTunes libraries, and then made playlists from them. But to you know to go now into say Spotify to uh, to get 
Beatles music now really doesn't mean that much to to me. But again, for young people, it's uh, pretty much the norm. Well, you know, everything you said there, Al, lends itself to a full show. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now, just, just, just to make a quick comment there, we live in a culture where we're kind of taught that whatever we've grown up on, whether it's music or TV shows or films, that's what we were exposed to in our youth. And so it appeals to that generation first, more than anybody else. And it's almost like it's a surprise when decades later, younger people discover the same things that we liked. So, you know, it's that's the way people think these days. I still come across people who when I when I bring up the Beatles, they'll say to me, well, that's from your generation. Mm. You know, you're always going to find people who are like that, that think that way, because that's the way that we're raised in this culture. Sure. But, you know, it's kind of funny. You just said something about the Beatles one. I was surprised at the success of the Beatles one. So were you. Sure. And why would you be surprised if, like you said, new generations are always discovering their music? So, you know, there is that thought in the back of our minds because that's the way that we're raised, that the music of the past is probably not going to attract the young people of today because that's the music we grew up with. That reached out to us. And the young people can't relate to it. You know, I'm not just talking about the Beatles. I'm talking about everything. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. But it is pretty remarkable that whether it's the Beatles one, whether it, it's the remasters, iTunes, whatever it is, somehow young people are still discovering the Beatles, regardless of how old this music is. And that's a testament to how great the music is. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's just that the that this um, that the the story that it's that young people are uh, are turning on to Beatles music through these through the streams. It's it just seems that it's it's certainly not a new phenomenon that uh, you know that young people have been turning on to Beatles music for a very long time. Mm-hmm. You know, so okay. uh, uh, so it's it's not you know it's not as if all of a sudden young people are you know, are listening to them only, only through the streaming, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's something that's been going on for, for a pretty long time now. Right. Can I just make one more observation, observation about, Mm -hmm. uh, we're a little bit format obsessed these days. I mean, uh, not that we're really obsessed, but somehow whenever there's a new format, it becomes a new story that, you know, isn't necessarily really a new story. It's just Mm -hmm. available in some other way. And it, sort of reminded me of you know years and years ago maybe 20 years ago maybe a little more when uh, maybe 30 uh when online was beginning to happen in a big way and newspapers were looking over their shoulders at what was going on and not a lot of newspapers were online yet but everyone was thinking about it and at the times we had sort of a big full staff meeting with arthur salzberger who's the publisher of the times and he said at one point you know I am format agnostic. I'm not married to the idea that the New York Times has to be printed on paper. If I could beam it directly to your cerebral cortex, I would do it. And, (laughs) you know, in a way, it's exactly the same thing with music, you know? I mean, okay, now it's streaming. Maybe someday they'll be able to beam it directly to our cerebral cortex. Yeah. Uh, But it'll just be another way to hear the stuff. And it, it... you know, it's kind of interesting, but it may be less of an amazing, you know, news story than it's being made to be. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd like to close this this topic with one quick question to ask everybody, and I don't mean to play devil's advocate here, but you know that when it comes to embracing new technology and all, uh, the Beatles and their music, it seems like they're always one of the last to do that. You know, it took them a long time to be on iTunes, and they're one of the last holdouts here for streaming. Do you think that part of the appeal and part of the reason why they've done so well with the streaming is because they waited so long and there is this big buildup? Is that part of the the plan (laughs) to make it successful because then people are craving it? You know, they want it more and more. You know, when when the Beatles music is one of the most noticeable ones out there that's not available and suddenly it is, it becomes a big news item. So is that part of the reason why it's successful now? Well, Ford would probably say 
that what they're doing is taking the 1940s approach to sex as it was when they grew up <laughs> and turning it into a marketing philosophy. <laughs> why, have, why buy the cow when you could have the milk for free? <laughs> mm. I don't know. It seems a little that way. In, in the case of CDs, they came late to it because EMI came late to it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, they didn't put out the first Beatles CDs till 87. Seven. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, CD came out in 83, 84, depending what part of the world you were living in. Mm. Um, and everybody was clamoring for it. And, you know, in a way, the fact that everybody was clamoring for it and the same on iTunes and the same on streaming has kind of made it into wow here it is finally let's let's go listen to it or buy it or whatever it is uh and mm. maybe that's true maybe that's true all right I, th I think it's because the you know the the audience is there you know now the 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 streaming the the various streaming um uh platforms have become have become so big that there is a there's a huge ready made audience there and the fact that young people have have shown themselves for quite a period of time, as I just mentioned, toward Beatles music, uh, just basically just means that the music is now being offered to this large, very large audience. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, you know cause and effect. I, I, but I, if the music if the music was made available when everybody else's music was made available. So the Beatles didn't stand out. Would it be doing as well? Mm, I, I, you know, I think I think there's it's a little different. I think it's um, uh, a case of supply. I mean, there's so much more music out there now that I don't think that people can't afford to buy it, and they and they wouldn't anyway because there's so many more formats available than there used to be. I mean, back in the '60s, you only had you only had vinyl. Uh, you don't have. You have a lot more than that now, and I think you know what this. What the streaming does is it gives people a, a access to more music that they don't necessarily have to own. I mean, they can keep it with them all at all times, but they don't necessarily. It's like it's like leasing a car almost. You know, I don't know. I've never leased a car, but I mean, it's kind of like that. You know, you. You know, you pay for it, but you don't own it. I mean, that's the same the same thing here. So, all right, all different ways of looking at this. You know, it's it's kind of different for for my brain to think. You know, it, if people are not buying it, is it still the same result? You know, but then again, I, I go on YouTube all the time and listen to music that I don't buy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, sometimes I go on YouTube and listen to music that I have already, but I'm too lazy to pick up the CD and program it. So it's the go. same thing, really. So let's move on here to uh, George Martin, who, as I said, January 3rd will be turning 90 years old. We owe so much to this man. It's kind of hard to imagine the Beatles story without his massive contribution to the group. So there's so much to talk about here of what he brought to the group, but... How about just talking about his background before we even uh, discuss his work with the Beatles? Who wants to start with that? That should probably be Alan, because certainly uh, uh, with, uh, with George's classical music background, uh, yep. I'm sure Alan can give us a good perspective on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, you know, as, as Al said, it was fundamentally classical but um not not purely classical i mean right. he, he also was into a sort of uh you know jazz and the popular music of his time mm -hmm. when he was growing up he um grew up i think you know in a relatively working class kind of home um he learned piano he ended up studying the oboe with uh jane asher's mother in fact um mm -hmm. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, and then went into the Air Force. He had some, he, he was in the dance band in the in the RAF and um, did some music of his own uh, there. And, you know, then when he got out and was, I think he was playing in Sadler's Wells Orchestra, which is a, an opera orchestra in England, um, and sort of lucked into the job at EMI when there was an assistantship opening, uh, and he applied for it. And he was, you know, in those days, I think it was um, 
looked upon uh, more favorably than it is now that you have some actual musical background if you want to be a record executive. Um, <laughs> now, now I don't think it's really regarded as that important, you know. Um, hmm. But it 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 served him well in that case because also as the head of of, of Parlophone or even as the assistant to the head of Parlophone at the time, I mean, part of his job was doing arrangements. Uh, you know, people would come in to record something, and and it would be his job to sort of say, okay, this would be good for uh, you know, uh, twenty strings and brass winds, et cetera, and then and then sort of score it out and do the sessions that way. And that was part of what he contributed to the Beatles too. Uh, not entirely, you know, what he did for the Beatles. I mean, some of of what he contributed to them was just a, a kind of musical sensibility. You know, I mean, that not adding strings necessarily, but maybe it would be good if the intro took a bit from this. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know, and there was a, a I think, a, a really important give and take with them. And uh, John sometimes liked to downplay George Martin's influence, but I think when it really came down to it even even john sort of probably knew what george martin's contributions to them were and i think without his classical background he couldn't have done a lot of what he did with the beatles i mean the scoring of yesterday and eleanor rigby and and a, a lot of the ideas he came up with simply knowing how instruments work you know what would be good for uh, for no one what kind of instrument would be good to have that solo in the middle you know you know, and then the Beatles had their own ideas. Obviously, they came in with, you know, Paul came in having heard a Bach Brandenburg concerto and wanted the the high broke trumpet on Penny Lane. But, you know, having someone like George Martin there who would know exactly what he was talking about and what musician to call uh, mm-hmm. is very crucial. So I think that's probably, you know, all we need to say about the the classical background but it's but it's not an unimportant detail but also in those early years of parlophone he also produced comedy records I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know he yeah. produced peter sellers and spike milligan he produced original cast albums so he had this incredible background very versatile which proved to be you know so important and um he, he was ready for the beatles obviously the beatles didn't know how far they'd be taking their careers and how creative they were going to become. But, you know, when the time came when they needed the scoring for an Eleanor Rigby or, um, say, Strawberry Fields Forever, George Martin proved to be the perfect man for that in so many ways by having this incredible background. There was another important thing early in his career. He made these electronic records, um, you know, with overdubbing and overdubbing. And, you know, when the technology was even more primitive than it was when the Beatles got there, he was putting together these sort of electronic semi-novelty records. But it involved a lot of techniques that he ended up using later with the Beatles, the sort of overdubbing and playing with speeds and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and that again made him perfect producer for them. I mean, uh, you know, who knows what would have happened if they signed with Decca? You know, I'm not mm. sure they could have gotten a producer with the combination of skills and background that George Martin had. I mean, it's it's very unlikely that they would have. So the electronic what? thing too in his early records is is worth mentioning. What was it? What, yeah. what, what, do you have Do you have some examples of the electronic <coughs> record, uh, Alan? Yeah, I'm just looking in his uh, in that box set. Uh, I can't think of the title, but he did. He you know he did them under under sort of pen names like Ray Cathode. You okay. know oh, yeah. that, that one. <laughs> okay, I, okay. I can't remember <laughs> the title of the record, but. You know, he would. They would be his own compositions and his own productions, and he would be doing the the music and put them out under those names. So you know, and between that and the comedy things that he did, I mean, that also made him, uh, you know, perfect person for them because mm-hmm. they knew his stuff. They knew his comedy stuff. And and and, uh, and of course, and he did the he did the Peter Sellers uh, Beatle parodies. Uh, that were that were good on two fronts because uh, Sellers was close to them and and 
and he and he was close to them. And there's a there's a there's a Peter Sellers box set that uh, it's I guess it's out of print now, but you can still find it. That has actually uh, some unreleased Beatles stuff or uh, Beatles uh, uh, covers by Sellers right. in it. Yeah. So and meanwhile, at, at about the same time that uh, George was doing those electronic records, he was also dipping his toe into rock and roll. Uh, with mm-hmm. the uh, with the Vipers Skiffle Band, uh, mm. who made a single called "No Other Baby," which Paul McCartney, in fact, right. covered years later, and uh, and also mainstream mainstream pop. He he was the producer of a of a fairly big hit, but well, uh, certainly a big hit in England and a pretty big hit in America for Matt Monroe in 1961 called "My Kind of Girl." Right, right. So yeah. he, so he was he was really all over the place in terms of um the you know the kind of the musical landscape that he was that he was surveying. He was also producer of Goldfinger by Shirley Bassey. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, which which I mean I I you you know I I was really stunned when I found that out. I did a an article a couple of years ago, just pulling out some of the lesser known tracks and, and the, my kind of girl and no other baby were two of the ones I found. Mm. But when I found Goldfinger, I was, I had to look, I, I had to, you know, really that really, but you know, uh, yeah. So, wow. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, amazing. Um, and he also, another track I found was a song called I've been wrong before done by Silla black that, was written by Randy Newman and was one of the first covers of a Randy Newman song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he also, he also issued on Parlophone. There was a goons album, right? Where it was take a, on bridge on the river Kwai, but it was called bridge on the river. Why? <laughs> and there would have been a problem if they had used Kwai. So we had to take all the K's out. <laughs> he had to edit that out <laughs> of the record. So, um, uh, yeah, he had all this enormous experience, which proved to be so valuable for the Beatles later on. The goon stuff was was very, very pre Monty Python. I mean, it, anybody that likes Monty Python would love the goons because they're you know, and I think Py- the Pythons have acknowledged the goons. Oh, sh- sure, very, very much mm-hmm. so. Uh, so yeah, there's a definite link between the goons and Monty Python mm-hmm. and the Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. It's, it's all one family. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, there's there's so many times when I'll see something the Beatles did, and I'll think it's Monty Python esque, especially in Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah. But they probably got it from the Goons. Yeah. So Possibly, you know. Yeah. And even those two, the, the as we were talking a couple of weeks ago, the '66 and '67 Beatles fan club Christmas messages are very, very much Goons uh, influenced. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's that's a really good point. Let's talk a little bit about some of the many contributions George Martin made to. Uh, the Beatles' music, some of which may not be as well known as others. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about "Please Please Me," where the Beatles originally had it as a slow song, and as John used to call it, very Roy Orbanesque. But it was um, George Martin who suggested to speed it up, which made all the difference in the world, apparently, mm-hmm. because when he heard the Beatles do it, the new version of it, he was convinced that it would be their first number one, which it was on many of the British charts. And also, um, the song Can't Buy Me Love is uh, another example of, well, originally they were going to start the song with the verses, but George Martin suggested to start with the chorus. Mm-hmm. So as soon as you hear you know, the beginning of Can't Buy Me Love, you're immedi- immediately taken in with the song. So it was just a great suggestion right there mm-hmm. and in the if, arrangement of that song. And of course, the, the best example, I think, of everything is Strawberry Feels Forever, all the work that he did with that. I mean that's just that's just amazing what he did there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, all the all the orchestral stuff that he did was just so brilliant, and um, I, I like to point to the ones that are overlooked sometimes, like "Good Night." You know, mm-hmm. one oh, amazing yeah. arrangement was done on that, mm-hmm. and I believe the Mike Sam singers also sing in that, as they did on "I Am the Walrus." Right. So you know, you've got not only the the string instruments, but you've got you know. Vocals added to it, kind of like a choir. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he had to think of all that, too. Let me ask all of you a question here, because very often you hear about producer versus engineer. And sometimes people may not know the difference. 
And in the story of the Beatles, you've got all these names like Norman Smith and certainly Jeff Emmerich, who brought so much innovation. Everybody points to him for all the close miking techniques that he brought to the Beatles. But also, you know, people like uh, Ken Scott, Phil McDonald, those people. How much credit do you give to them as opposed to the producer? Can the producer sometimes be kind of overrated in his contribution? And maybe, maybe you should be giving more of the credit to what the engineers bring to the table. Who wants to add something on that? It's a team, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the, the producer is where the buck stops, you know. I mean, all of them un- undoubtedly made important contributions. Um, some of the engineers probably, I, I think in the way it's supposed to be delineated, the producer is the one who's supposed to come up with all of the ideas about how to get the sound and the engineers simply execute what they do. But, you know, in, in the case of the Beatles at EMI, the demands that they were making were such that the engineers had maybe technical skills in terms of the electronics that George Martin didn't necessarily have, you know, his were musical. Um, Mm. and so they, they all contributed various things, you know, I mean, George Martin might not have been able to come up with ADT, the uh, automatic double track. He was automatic double tracking or that kind of thing. I mean, that was a technical innovation. So, you know, there was, there were contributions from everywhere, but, you know, finally, I think the the music is the issue, and that was where his big contributions were. I think taste mm-hmm. and sensibility were sort of what he brought to things. Right. It's also probably, you know, we were talking just a few minutes ago about arranging and all the arrangements he did. I mean, and it's also interesting to keep in mind that all of these arrangements, the Beatles arrangements that we're talking about i mean he sort of did just about overnight it's not like uh you know okay in two months we're going to do uh some tracks where we need orchestral arrangements and here's a demo of the song you can do the orchestral arrangements from that it would in a lot of cases it was sort of they'd go into the studio and record and then two days later he'd be there with his arrangement and the people to play it you know and it's the, right. the, yeah. the speed involved <clears throat> and the deafness is mm-hmm. uh kind of an interesting thing too i mean something like strawberry fields you know i mean he had a little bit of time for that but not much you know and for a score that complicated so that's interesting you can apply that to how quickly the beatles came up with their material Mm -hmm. you know on the spot you know and had to come up with things because they had these deadlines to meet and yet they were able to crank out so much strong material very Mm -hmm. quickly so it applied to both the songwriting as well as the arranging what are, to you, the, the best arrangements that George Martin brought to the Beatles' music? How about you, Al? The funny thing is, um, <laughs> when you said arrangements, the, the one that sprang to mind was She's Leaving Home, except that he didn't do the arrangement for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, but yeah. uh, uh, certainly, you know, Ella, well, I guess, I guess yesterday, the the fact that uh, that he was that George was inspired to add you know just a string quartet on as you know instead of a you know a full orchestral backing you know just something very very tasteful to to kind of accompany you know what was basically simply Paul and and his guitar mm. you know so. wasn't wasn't the story uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Didn't George Martin want to have more of an orchestra for that song? And Paul told him he didn't want it to sound like Montavani. I think, yeah, I think, I think so. And then, and then he he said, "Well, how about a string quartet?" Right. And that was, you know, much more ac- um, uh, accessible for Paul, you know. But then in on Eleanor Rigby, where there is a you know a much fuller, um, you know, uh, backing. It's in fact, especially if you listen to the, uh, the 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 backing track, which was on the second anthology set. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful piece, just on its own, even without the uh, the vocal. Absolutely, so, yeah. So that certainly has to go in, and as you know, one of the, as a as a favorite. Yeah, you just mentioned the backing tracks on anthology two. You got to point out within you, without you, which I love to bring out too, because. It's that marriage of the Indian instruments with all the the um, the Western instruments yes, as well. Certainly. So, and what skill that took, 
<laughs> to uh, have a marriage of those two together. I mean, that was so brilliant in and of itself. Well, Steve, even, how about you? Well, I was going to say within you without you, but it, I was thinking more of the tempos, not necessarily the merging of the cultures, but the the various mm-hmm. tempos that that he that were mixed together on that track were just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it was just you know, and and I think we all, uh, I think a lot of people with uh, for obvious reasons will give credit to uh, George Harrison, but yeah, George Martin d- definitely deserves credit there too i mean that's brilliant the way that goes the other song mm-hmm. i was i would be think i would think of would be eleanor rigby i don't think so much of yesterday only because it, the the arrangement the, the the string quartet was very kind of a plain whereas eleanor rigby was a little more um complex um and uh you know so but um yeah, between Within You, Without You and Eleanor Rigby, those two are just just absolutely amazing. And, a, hmm. and Alan mentioned Good Night, which mm-hmm. is which is that might be that might be more of a favorite for me than even the others that I mentioned because it was just it's just so beautiful. And the funny thing, I always I always thought because after you know with all the brouhaha that came up after Spectre added an orchestra and voices and all onto the long and winding road that, you know, why didn't, why wasn't there this same kind of brouhaha over, over good night mm-hmm. from say, you know, unreconstructed rockers who think, well, this is a, this is a rock and roll band. What are all these strings doing on here? But it's, but, mm-hmm. but it's a beautiful, beautiful arrangement. One other song that none of us mentioned, and I'm surprised, Ken, that you didn't mention it, was Live and Let Die. Um, well, we, ha- we haven't gotten to the solo music yet. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking, about, talking about George Martin. And, I mean, that, that particular song, I mean, he, mm-hmm. you know, and the way Paul, you know, uses that now, I mean, you know, in, in, in his concerts. But, uh, I mean, that's just, you know, that's amazing, too. Um, right. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, you couldn't have found a better producer for Live and Let Die mm-hmm. than George Martin. How about you, Alan? Um, well, a lot of the ones that were mentioned. I mean, Eleanor Rigby was. Um, it was actually still pretty spare. It was a string octet, so it was basically the same ensemble as uh-huh. played on yesterday, but double. You know, twice as many. Um, I I don't think that the arrangement for yesterday is quite as simple as. Steve mentioned it, it has some beautiful touches in it, mm-hmm. but you know, often that's the case with really well crafted music. It, it seems simpler than it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree about within you, without you, and the and the amazing thing about that, in a way, is that when you listen to some of the comments George Martin made around the time of anthology, where he talked about how you know he only later came to realize what a good song it was. If you, you sort of backtrack and you think, okay, well, so he did that incredible arrangement thinking it was basically just a throwaway track that, that he didn't even care that much for. And yet really came up with an incredible score that wrapped around the instrument, the Indian instruments, or it was in dialogue with the Indian instruments in a really beautiful way. But, you know, I mean, that, that, that again is a, a sort of a quality of, a first class musician, you know, there is no throwaway music. You're doing something publicly, you do the best you can do, whether you personally think it's the greatest track in the world or not. The story of She's Leaving Home is kind of interesting because it was, uh, I think that was a little bit of a power play. You know, George Martin was unavailable when they wanted that arrangement done. And so they just called up the next guy, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's hard not to read that as Paul saying basically, okay, you know, you work for us and we come first, you know? Um, Mm. And that's, it's, it's a pity. I mean, it's, that's a nice arrangement, but I, I think it's, uh, it, wasn't probably necessary to do it that way. And I'd be really interested to know what kind of arrangement George Martin would have come up with for that song. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, the horn scoring on for no one, you mm. know, it's, it's really just a, a fairly short part, uh, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. And he found, uh, uh, you know, one of the best horn players in England to do it. Um, 
when I uh, when Alan Civil died, I wrote his obituary, and you know he had he was known for a lot of classical repertory. I mean, his Mozart horn concertos are great. He works with Benjamin Britten, stuff like that. But, you know, most people, the, the, in terms of the numbers of people involved, most people know him for that solo. And he acknowledged as much. It's quoted in the Lewison books saying, you know, I, I meet people in airports and do they say they like my Mozart? No, it's this solo I played in the Beatles song that was like 53 seconds long or, or maybe less. <laughs> And uh, and I put that in the hope ed and one of my editors uh, the next day said, you know, you've completely distorted this guy's life, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, which I, I don't think is fair because he, he said so himself. But, you know, I mean, as French horn solos go, that is, is really stunning. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing George Martin could write. I mean. He just he just had an ear for exactly what they needed at the time. And Strawberry Fields is another one. If you listen to, as, as you can on certain um, semi-legal, perhaps even totally illegal recordings, um, <laughs> you listen to just the orchestral take, um, even without the vocals, you hear that, you know, he took um, Paul's intro, the Mellotron intro, and he put it in the brass um, and that's kind of interesting because he, he wasn't taking the cue of the sounds Paul was using, which were flute sounds. Um, he made it into a brass thing. He, he changed the key because he wanted to use the open bottom string of the cello, um, because an open string is going to resonate in, in a way that a, a stopped string isn't. Um, so he, he just wanted that sound. I mean, he so completely knew what he was doing all the time. And I mean, and that turned out to be really lucky because if he hadn't changed that key for the sake of getting that open tone, then when John wanted the two versions joined, he wouldn't have been able to do it because it was the fact that they were in two different keys that made it possible, you know, and two different tempos. So, um, he, he sort of lucked out there, but, but the arrangement itself is, is really incredible. The tempos thing is what always gets me. Yeah. The fact that they did it so much faster mm. yeah. in that second version, it just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, It's like we said in our Beatles Miracle show. It's like, yeah. Yeah. how is it possible they could have done two different versions like that? You speed one up, you slow one down, and then they match. It's just yeah. uh, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, for the same money, um, they, could have done the, they could have done the one in the higher key slower, and that would have, mm. that would have made it impossible. Everything just yeah. fell together, you know? I want to very quickly just mention um, the fact that George Martin played piano mm -hmm. on quite a lot of sure. Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many solos and very fast ones, I shouldn't say fast, very concise ones, um, were just what was necessary for the record. I mean, I think of Not a Second Time. In My Life. In My uh, Life, yeah, absolutely. In My Life is definitely... And, and what was interesting about In My Life is that he actually recorded it at half speed mm -hmm. on the tape. So when he played it back, it actually sounded, it was on a piano, and it sounds like a harpsichord when you, when you hear the release version. Mm. I love his piano playing on Rocky Raccoon. It's got that, uh, mm -hmm. what would you call it? Barrel Not ragtime. Sort of barrel house. Yeah. Play the yeah. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. And, and Lovely Rita is kind of the same way. So uh, very important parts of the songs, short parts of the songs, but important nonetheless came from George Martin on a lot of Beatle records. Uh, also, uh, Hard Day's Night, the, the piano solo in there, too. Uh -huh. That's right. And, uh -huh. uh, and rock and roll music, where he plays one of the pianos. Yeah, well, there's three Beatles. Right. There's, there's um, John, Paul, and George Martin right. playing the piano yeah. on, right. on that song. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, let's, let's um, since you mentioned Live and Let Die, Steve, I wanted to bring up... Um, George Martin's work with Paul in particular as a solo artist, beyond Live and Let Die, you've got uh, Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, and Give My Regards to Broad Street. And we've, we've talked a bit about Tug of War and Pipes of Peace recently. Certainly Tug of War, to me, is one of the great masterpieces in Paul's solo career. But even when you go later into Paul's uh, solo career, he did some work on um, the Flaming Pie album, mm -hmm. did some of the arrangements on Some Days, which is a gorgeous song. Yeah. As is uh, Beautiful Night and um, Calico Skies. And he also uh, did the arrangement on We All Stand Together, 
which I think was absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. A lot of people make fun of that record, but it was a song for an animated film, <laughs> and it worked well in that format. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about a song for kids. You know, we all stand together fits perfectly for that kind of song. And again, like I said about "Live and Let Die," you couldn't have found a better arranger than George Martin. When you need someone with Paul McCartney to do strings and horns, who better than than George Martin? Mm-hmm. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, we all stand together. Absolutely, is is a oh, mas- yeah, is that. a masterful arrangement. I love that mm-hmm. song. You know, it's uh, and it's just a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful record. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's just it's just too bad that people here in the U.S. really don't know it because Thomas at least uh, or because Rupert uh, Rupert the Bear uh, is really so much a you know a British animated character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Alan, you want to add anything on this? No, I, I basically agree with what's been said. Um, I have I've a, a couple of other things that I wanted to comment on sort of more generally about his production. And one is, you know, maybe I should have said this more towards the beginning, but he had a feeling that also is yet another one of these things that made him perfect for the Beatles, which is that – he felt that the producer's job and the job of someone capturing sound for a record should not simply be that the record wasn't simply a pipeline from the stage to your living room. And in his time, when he was much younger, a lot of people, a lot of producers felt that it was, and a lot of artists felt that it was, that, you know, I'm going in the studio, I'm playing my thing, you're capturing it exactly as it is, and you're putting it out there. George Martin recognized that a record was a different thing, and that you could do things like speed things up and slow things down, and and that basically you were making a sound painting, um, not just capturing a bunch of people in a room playing. And that was an attitude that maybe in the beginning of the Beatles didn't come out so much because he was pretty much capturing them, but in an idealized way, you know. Um, but once they started overdubbing and bringing in different things, different kinds of instruments, playing with speeds, that kind of stuff, I mean, that was exactly um, his in his wheelhouse, so to speak. And the mm-hmm. other thing I wanted to mention before before I forget, as we get on to the solo things, is that he also made a really important contribution to the world of production itself. And it's partly because EMI was so parsimonious. You know, he was he went in, I think, in 1965 for a contract renewal, having made all the money for EMI that he did in 1964 and 65 and late 63. And they were going to give him really a pittance as a raise. And he and John Burgess and some other British producers from other labels banded together and started an independent production company called Air. Uh, was can't remember the, what Air actually stands for. It's something associated. Independent, independent recording recorders right recorders. Right. yeah um and that was kind of an important you know there were obviously independent producers like phil Spector and and others in the united states but it was very unheard of in england mo- mostly unheard of in england and certainly someone of his prominence stepping outside the employ of a major record label and you know he the beatles were obviously interested in continuing working with him and they were in a position to tell EMI no we're not going to we're not going to go with whatever staff producer you replace him with we want him and uh and and that I think was you know simply in the world of record production that was a very important move mm-hmm. so I think you know I just think that should be mentioned too mm-hmm. well put and I always remember George Martin always using that phrase sound painting mm-hmm. he liked to use that a lot Yeah. Um, Let's just bring up very quickly Ringo's first album, Sentimental Journey, because George Martin actually produced that album. And sometimes people forget that fact. I really think that, you know, Ringo was ahead of his time without trying to be ahead of his time. He just wanted to put out an album of of standards to please his parents, basically. These are all songs that he grew up hearing, as the other Beatles did, too. Mm 
But how do you feel George Martin fit in that role as producer for that particular album, an album of all standards? Why don't we start with Steve? I think that, I mean, uh, I, I don't see anything out of the ordinary as far as, I mean, George was a, uh, George Martin was a, you know, a longtime producer. He'd, he'd been through all sorts of, you know, all sorts of music um, of, you know, different kinds. I don't think that was out of, really out of the ordinary. Maybe the only odd thing about it was the fact that it was Ringo. If you want to, you know, a, a, maybe Ringo was the one that was really experimenting there and not George Martin. Well, I don't know if Ringo knew how he wanted to start his solo career. It's just what he was doing in the moment. I'm not saying this is out of the ordinary for George Martin, because like we've discussed, he had such a full background anyway. But um, And Ringo's voice really suited a lot of the songs on, on that particular album. They didn't require that big a vocal range, at least these particular arrangements. Mm-hmm. But um, any thoughts from, from you, Alan and Al, about Sentimental Journey and George Martin and whether or not you feel he brought what was necessary for that album? One thing that is kind of out of the ordinary is that there were a number of arrangers right. on, the, right. on the album. So we were talking before about all the different arrangements uh, that George had brought to, to the Beatles uh, or had given to the Beatles. Uh, but uh, for this particular album, he uh, was uh, more of a background uh, figure, you know, as a, as a producer, and let others like like Morris Gibb, like Paul McCartney, like you know various others do Quincy the, Jones. Quincy Jones, yes, absolutely, mm-hmm. do, do the arranging, and uh, it's and it's uh, and it's part of the uh, because that that was a you know uh, I think people underestimate how much of a, a kind of a landmark album that was because it really was the first time that a uh, that a you know a contemporary rock artist did an album of pop standards, and it really set the um, you know set the template, if you will, for the the you know the Harry Nilsons and Willie Nelsons and uh, Linda Ronstadt, and Linda Ronstadt, and later on Rod Stewart and all uh, of doing uh, doing albums of of pop standards, and Paul McCartney, and oh, and, and sure. Absolutely. Sure. Also, since we mentioned Ringo, um, there's a song called I'm Yours, which closes the Vertical Man album. And George Martin did the string arrangement on that song, a real tender ballad, which was really nice. So a few things that he brought to later Beatles projects, for example, on, um, well, actually a solo one here, the Lennon Anthology. He and Giles Martin worked on the uh, orchestral arrangement for Grow Old With Me. Oh, yeah. Added a real nice touch on that. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, on The Beatles' Love, they did the same thing for While My Guitar Gently Mm Leaves. For the acoustic demo that that George made. And, you know, both recordings are just gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. We're all all very agreeable. (laughs) Uh And yet at the same time, well, roughly at the same time, he was also producing a band as hard-edged, although with a definite Beatles influence, as Cheap Trick. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. It was a natural for them to want to choose uh, George Martin, as America did mm-hmm. as well. Yes. And um, just to mention a few of the artists outside of the Beatles that George Martin produced. Well, we have to mention some of those 60s acts that were in the Brian Epstein stable. Yeah, sure. Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. Scylla Black, Jerry and the Pacemakers. Also, like you mentioned, Al, Matt Monroe. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, America, Jimmy Webb, Jeff Beck, mm-hmm. the uh, the Blow by Blow album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Right. He also produced uh, Elton John, that recording of Candle in the Wind. Right. The one that was the tribute to um, Princess Diana. Princess Diana. Mm-hmm. That was like the biggest, one of the biggest selling singles ever worldwide. Mm-hmm. So, you know, his contributions go far beyond just the Beatles. Yeah. I th- I think if you you especially have to mention Scylla Black. I mean, there's a couple yes. of compilations that they've put out and I have I happen to own both of them. Um one is a um a 3 CD set of just all her st- of all stuff he did and the other is a 6 disc 5 CD 1 DVD set that is mostly George Martin. I mean, that's quite a bit of production there um so mm-hmm. i mean while the beatles of course get 
you know, get first mention when you talk about George Martin. I think Scylla probably should get second mm-hmm. um, because he did he did so much. He did so much with her. And another song that I don't think we mentioned was um, Ferry Cross the Mersey, which he also did. Sure. So. Well, would you say Scylla was was more important in George's career than, say, Billy J. Kramer or Jerry and the Pacemakers? Oh, yeah. In, in terms of in terms of sheer numbers of songs. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I think you almost have to say that. Um, I mean, you know, granted, um, Billy J, especially, you know, got uh, more recognition over here than she did. But in turn, I mean, the fact is, you know, I mean, Scylla was Scylla still is a big name in England and a big business, um, you know, over there. Um, so mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think you have to, you know, recognize that 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 has continued to, to live on and she's still. Like I said, she's put out some major compilations within the past couple of years of his st- of the stuff that he did with her, you know, including right. outtakes, including outtakes and everything that are actually pretty good. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you like, especially the that step inside love outtake that uh, with McCartney on it is interesting. Um, so, mm-hmm. well, every now and then there are new compilations that come out on Billy J. Kramer too, as well as Jerry mm-hmm. and the Pacemakers. So. Right, right, but but just. And you know, just the the fact that there's such a large body of work that the mm-hmm. two of, that the two of them worked on together, mm-hmm. um, you know, really second only to the Beatles. Right. I mean, I'm I'm looking I'm looking at the completely Scylla, which is the five CDs, one DVD set, and I think there's there's roughly like uh, pretty close to it, like 125 tracks here. Um, I mean, that's a lot. And they go all the you know they go all the way back, uh, you know I, I'd have to open it up and see what year, but I'm 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 guessing '62. Um, they start, and in fact the cover of the the cover of the book has her and George Martin on it. So, and in fact it has an interview with George Martin in it. So, um, yeah, I know George Martin has said he really loved working with Scylla. Mm-hmm. He thought mm-hmm. the world of her. Mm-hmm. So I, I think a difference and, as well is that it's it. Um, Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J were are essentially, you know, sort of oldies acts. I mean, they still do things and they're still out there, but they're mainly looking backwards at the things that they did. Whereas Scylla right. had a career that, you know, continued, you know, towards the present. I mean, you know, she with TV and everything else that she mm-hmm. did. I mean, she... Yeah, you know, well, you see, you know what I'm saying. I mean, she continued um, to sort of right. unfold in a way that they didn't. Much well, as I love the, Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Kramer. Well, don't tell Billy J. that because he's forever pushing his new music. And he's very proud of, uh, he made a new album recently called I Won the Fight. And he co-wrote many of the songs on the album. And when you see him in concert, he does several of those songs. It's not just an oldie show. He doesn't want to be known as an oldies act. But he's kind of pushed in that direction because those are the offers that he gets. Most right. of the time, yeah. so especially over here, uh, you know, and I think if and and I don't I don't recall that Scylla ever came back here within the past decade. Is that uh, oh no, remember? not not at all because she didn't like traveling, right? Um, but I mean, it, had she come back here, she would not have been doing her. She would have not have been asked to do her new stuff. Everybody would have been asking her to do the old stuff. Well. So, well, of course, she hadn't recorded in many years. You know, she was, you know, basically the the the, the last few chapters of her career were as a TV artist. Mm-hmm. You know, right. with uh, the you know with her the uh, the blind date show and then other various mm-hmm. uh, TV you know quiz shows and chat shows and things like that. Right. So uh, you know, so really, she didn't really have any really new music. You know, for a goodly, you know, a goodly portion of her career. But I mean, the the bottom line is that, that George Martin's work with her was was oh, yeah. a, a major chapter yes. in both oh. his life and hers. Very true. So. Yeah, as much as I hate to admit it, you know, most people in America didn't know Scylla Black. No. And um, she was more a footnote in Beatle history yeah, here. Yeah. Whereas in England, she was the biggest thing. I, I've heard it said she was the biggest female. Uh, singer of the 60s in terms of hits in the UK mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. 60s so but over here it was just the the one single you're my world which made the top 40 and that was it yeah so um, you know she really wasn't that well known here um, I do want to make quick mention of George Martin's success in particular with America 
because some of the biggest hits that they had, yeah, uh, certainly in the U.S. I always point to Sister Golden Hair, uh-huh. which was a you know a number one hit here. Always starts off like My Sweet Lord. Mm, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that was that was George Martin in the mid seventies. There, uh, George Martin produced a few albums for America, and they really sounded great. They were a good team together. Mm-hmm. Cool. See, I wasn't so much an America fan, really, but. I admired the things he did with, you know, I, I like Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow uh-huh. and um, Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now, is that what it was? Apocalypse. Just sorry. Just Apocalypse. Uh, the John <laughs> McLaughlin album. That was a really kind of difficult project because it was basically an electric guitar concerto with jazz band and full symphony orchestra. And um, I've heard that the recording of that was as problematic as some of the big Beatles things like a day in the life, you know, where they had the orchestra in one room and McLaughlin and his band in another room and trying to sort of have everybody hear what was going on and sync them up was very difficult, but it's, I think it's a great album. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when I think of of George Martin's non Beatles productions, post Beatles, non Beatles productions, um, those are the ones that stand out for me. You know, I mean, sort of aware that he did America, but um, for some reason, America just didn't do it for me. Mm. (laughs) Hey, we can finally disagree on something on this show. (laughs) Let's go for it. (laughs) I I was going to say the the Silla stuff really stands out for me, partially because I have it, you know, because I really like I really like her stuff. I mean, she was she was a great singer. And, you know, I'm glad that he was the one that helped her. All right, let's wrap things up with a couple of quick questions here. I know that several years back, Howard Stern made some comment about George Martin complaining that George was taking too much credit for the Beatles' success. And like you were saying before, Alan, um, John had said something to the effect that, you know, what was George Martin without us? You know, after the Beatles broke up, what was he doing? Nothing. At least that's what John had said in his own mind. He thought that way. Is there too much credit being given to this man, or do we think that, um, you know, he's so much uh, an important part of this story? I mean, to me, it's pretty obvious. I I really can't see the Beatles story (laughs) unfolding the way that it did without the massive, it's it's incomprehensible, the contribution that George Martin made. But do you think sometimes it's kind of overrated, or is it like you said before, or we said before, give and take on both sides? I think, um, you know, the only degree to which I would say is overrated is when you get people come up to you and say, oh, well, you know, it was all George Martin, you know. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was the one who did all their stuff. And it's, you know, that's not really true. Uh, it's not even really remotely true. I think that there was a chemistry between him and them that they would not have had with any other producer. And I think that he was an absolutely essential ingredient to a lot of their greatest stuff. And the fact that, you know, even their, even their very early stuff, the way it was done and, um, you know, you can argue whether or not, you know, he, you know, these days post, post Lewis in volume one, yes. it's harder to, to say that he was the only one who had the perspicacity to sign them because maybe he was forced into it. But nevertheless, I mean, there was something about the chemistry between George Martin and the Beatles that made their sound and, and what they did, you know, possible, um, you know, look, you can, you can listen to the deck audition, you know, and OK, it had Pete Best in it rather than Ringo. And that was a big difference. I think that um, it's kind of clear that they really blossomed once they were in their partnership with George Martin. And uh, I except to give him complete credit for everything they did, which, you know, people weirdly sometimes do, except for that, I, I don't think that you can really exaggerate his importance. It's it's he just was absolutely crucial. And, and, he, and of course you you also have to give credit to George Martin for allowing the Beatles to blossom the way that they did. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and to come up with all the ideas and to accept them. Well there were uh there were a lot of courses, especially in that era, there were a lot of pop acts 
who you know they who were pigeonholed into one little musical uh you know genre and but Ken is absolutely right that that George allowed the Beatles to to grow musically in a way that a lot of acts of that uh, you know even of that era probably were not allowed to but also I was going to mention that you know that those comments from from John Lennon uh, were you know came from that period where he was basically slagging off everybody, you know, other than him and Yoko, you know. So I think the I think those those comments have to be taken with uh, you know more than more than a few grains of salt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I I, th I think the the using the term allow is probably going to get interpreted by some people in the wrong way. I don't know that allow is probably the best word. I think in the beginning, I think the degree of, you know, the way they worked was different than obviously later on. I think, you know, it evolved over time. I think the, the I think cooperation is probably a better term um, between the two. I mean, they had, they had, they had, har they were very harmonic. Uh, they had great harmony together. And I think, you know, that's the, I think that's the key there. Um, I mean, it didn't, it, you know, obviously as they got, more famous and they realized what they were you know things changed a little bit but i, I mean there was you know there was a harmony there that uh, that they've acknowledged that the beatles have acknowledged and that you know it's really evident when you look at what they did so um anyway. but even early on even early on george martin made some key decisions mm -hmm. in right. the group i mean no, that's, as time I, that's, goes on the whole the whole story about how do you do it becomes more and more important to me Right. Mm -hmm. Because no, that I, could have ended up being a single. That could have been a Beatles single. And if that had been a big hit, as it was for Jerry and the Pacemakers, then the Beatles might have had to say, well, you know what you're doing, George. You know, you decide what the next move will be. Maybe he wouldn't have accepted Please Please Me as, as the next Beatles single. And if mm -hmm. Please Please Me hadn't have been the biggest, the biggest hit, well, or if Please Please Me hadn't become the huge hit that it was, then maybe George Martin wouldn't have allowed the Beatles singles to be original songs. That's an inter that's an interesting what if, but you know, I mean, you can, you can tell by the record they they really weren't into it, and you know, I mean, the whatever you know, even even uh, what Lewison says about it, you can you can say okay, um, but I mean, we don't really know, you know, we weren't there in the studio. So I don't know that you know it's hard it's hard to say exactly what happened, but like I said, the record is the is the best evidence that they really didn't they really didn't like it you know and I don't think any producer would have gone ahead and tried to release that as a single I think you know. but the bottom line is the producer made the final say here mm -hmm. so he he let the Beatles have please please me as their next single and that mm -hmm. changed everything in a way so. You know, in the beginning, George Martin really wanted How Do You Do It to be the Beatles' next single. He believed in that song. He thought it was a hit. And he was proven right with Jerry and the Pacemakers. And you can say all you want, the Beatles didn't put their heart into it. And maybe you hear that. A lot of people do hear that. Mm -hmm. And yet you, you hear Dave Morell tell the story when John Lennon played it <laughs> for him. And he was excited about that song. So I don't know. It's yeah. uh, there's there's a lot of what ifs in the Beatles story, whether you like it or not. The Beatles story, as proven by Mark Lewison, had a lot of twists and turns in it, where things could have gone in a very different direction. And how do you do? It's one of the key examples of that, at least to me, anyway. It's another aspect of 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 why George Martin was sort of uniquely. Uh, the person for them. I mean, there was a producer model uh, that was much more common at the time, which is the producer is the boss in the recording studio, and you do right. what the producer says, and yep. the producer makes a decision. There are a lot of artists out there talking about, you know, looking back and saying, yeah, I didn't want to do this, but he made me, you know, or we didn't, we wouldn't have released this, but that's what the company did. Mm. Um, and George Martin saw it, you know, going all the way back to those early sessions as more of a participatory democracy. He, he, he took their views into account. And the other thing is that he let them into the control room. Mm 
And that was another crucial thing because, you know, they weren't all technical, but Paul certainly was keen on looking into what went on in the mixing board and everything. And George, to some degree, um, possibly John, to some degree, it's hard to tell because George Martin always said he was the least technical of them all. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the fact that the Beatles got into the control room and could also have a say about what they wanted on the technical side of things is something that, again, if they had signed to DECA, might not have happened, you know. Um, so, you know, there, there are just so many things that make George Martin the perfect guy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that openness to their opinions about what they wanted out there, the, the openness to letting them take a hand in – some production decisions it, it's all there mm -hmm. just imagine every time that they made some major forward move mm -hmm. say going from rubber soul to revolver mm -hmm. and he just accepted it yeah i mean obviously the beatles had more power then but still you got to give george martin credit for the fact that he allowed them to experiment and grow and he nurtured them and he did all this and you know he deserves all the more credit and respect for that and there's one last thing, without us forgetting. He did uh, do a lot of arranging and composing for A Hard Day's Night, all the instrumental stuff sure. that was done there, mm -hmm. which, you know, a lot of Beatle fans love that. Oh, yeah. You know, I still get, I get requests on my radio show for This Boy every now and then, sure. the arrangement of that, and the music from uh, Yellow Submarine. A yeah. lot of people grew up on side two of that album, and, uh, you know, it was really just, Incredible compositions and perfect, perfect scoring for that film, which, again, George Martin was so adept at doing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, things like Pepperland. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, uh, was just, you know, excellent, excellent soundtrack music. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Anybody want to add anything else as far as George Martin's contribution to the Beatles and music in general? I, I guess just that he was the, uh, you know, there are there are several different, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 puzzle that became the Beatles story. There are so many different elements into that, and there are certain extremely important elements to it. Brian Epstein was certainly one, and George Martin was another. Mm -hmm. You know, a very very important uh, element. You know, without uh, without him. Without Brian Epstein, without Ringo, uh, the story might have had a very, very different, uh, uh, you know, um, turn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. The Beatles proved to be so incredibly talented with what they what they gave us musically, but they were also extremely lucky. Yes. That things turned out the way that they did. Yeah. All right. So, do you, any of you have anything you'd like to plug? Let me just quickly mention, I did a story on Beatles Examiner yesterday that was just kind of a uh, something that um, I had, I concocted and it actually turned out better than I thought it would. Uh, Beatle links to the, some of the people that passed away this year. And um, I actually, mm -hmm. there were some surprises in there. A couple of people that I didn't know actually had passed away, but uh, there, uh, it's an, an interesting little article. So it's on Beatles Examiner if you're so interested. Mm. I just read it, too. Mm -hmm. Me, too. Yeah. It's a very, very, uh, it's, it's surprising how many people. Yeah. You didn't mention yes. Dennis Ferrante, though. She put Dennis Ferrante. No, I did, I did not. Ooh, I'm going to have to add him. I'll have to add Dennis in. Thank you for, I knew there yes, was somebody people, I would, I knew there's somebody I'd miss. For people who don't know, he was one of John's engineers mm -hmm. from Imagine through Rock and Roll, and a great friend to me and very supportive of my work on the radio on the Beatles. He was a guest on my show many times, and um, he made a great contribution to John's music, especially, I've heard it said, a lot, a lot of work on Walls and Bridges in particular. And, um, yeah, another, one of the many people that, unfortunately, we lost in 2015. Okay. Thank you for reminding me about that. So Yeah. There we go. All right. This has been great, talking about George Martin and his great contribution to the Beatles and to the world. And uh, for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels, along with Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen, thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.